Um, well, uh, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thanks for coming a little bit earlier today uh, so that we can uh, go through this uh, material. So <clears throat> uh, we, we are continuing in our discussion of uh, Daniel 7 through Daniel 9. So let's do this. Uh, let's uh, reread Daniel 7, because I have a few more things I want to mention about Daniel 7 before we move on. So uh, let me take you to the text. And, uh, and we will read that together. And you should see that come across your screen in just a moment. Okay. Daniel 7. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel saw a dream and visions in his mind as he lay on his bed. Then he wrote the dream down and related the following summary of it. Daniel said, I was looking in my vision by night and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea and four great beasts were coming up from the sea, different from one another. The first was like a lion and had the wings of an eagle. I kept looking until its wings were plucked and it was lifted up from the ground and made to stand on two feet like a man. A human mind also was given to it. And behold, another beast, a second one resembling a bear. And it was raised up on one side and three ribs were in its mouth between its teeth. And thus they said to it, arise, devour much meat. After this, I kept looking and behold, another one like a leopard, which had on its back four wings of a bird. <clears throat> the beast also had four heads and dominion was given to it. After this, I kept looking in the night visions and behold a fourth beast, dreadful and terrifying and extremely strong. And it had, had large iron teeth. It devoured and crushed and trampled down the remainder with its feet. And it was different from all the beasts that were before it and it had 10 horns. While I was contemplating the horns, behold another horn, a little one came up among them. And three of the first horns were pulled out by the roots before it and behold, this horn possessed eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth uttering great boasts. I kept looking until thrones were set up and the ancient of days took his seat. His vesture was like white snow and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was ablaze with flames. Its wheels were burning, uh, were a burning fire. A river of fire was flowing and coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands were attending him and myriads upon myriads were standing before him. The court sat and the books were open. Then I kept looking because of the sound of the boastful words which the horn was speaking. I kept looking until the beast was slain and its body was destroyed and given to the burning fire. As for the rest of the beasts, their dominion was taken away, but an extension of life was granted to them for an appointed period of time. I kept looking in the night visions and behold with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming, and he came up to the ancient of days, days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion, glory, and the kingdom. Then all the peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. Not all the peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him, serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which will not pass away. And his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. As for me, Daniel, my spirit was distressed within me and the visions in my mind kept alarming me. I approached one of those who were standing by and began asking him the exact meaning of all this. So he told me and made known to me the interpretation of these things. These great beasts, which are four in number, are four kings who will arise from the earth. But the saints of the highest one will receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever for all ages to come. Then I desired to know the exact meaning of the fourth beast, which was different from all the others, exceedingly dreadful, with its teeth of iron and its claws of bronze, and which devoured, crushed, and trampled down the remainder with its feet, and the meaning of the ten horns that were on its head, and the other horn which came up, and before which three of them fell, namely that horn which had eyes and a mouth uttering great boasts, and which was larger in appearance than its associates. I kept looking, and that horn was waging war with the saints and overpowering them, until the Ancient of Days came and judgment was passed in favor of the saints for the highest one. And the time arrived when the saints took possession of the kingdom. Thus he said, the fourth beast will be a fourth kingdom on the earth, 
which will be different from all the other kingdoms and will devour the whole earth and tread it down and crush it. As for the ten horns, out of this kingdom ten kings will arise, and another will arise after them, and he will be different from the previous ones and will subdue three kings. He will speak out against the Most High and wear down the saints of the highest one, and he will intend to make alterations in times and in law, and they will be given to his hand for a time, times, and half a time. But the court will sit for judgment, and his dominion will be taken away, annihilated, and destroyed forever. Then the sovereignty, the dominion, and the greatness of all the kingdoms under the whole heaven will be given to the people of the saints of the highest one. His kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom, and all the dominions will serve and obey him. At this point, the revelation ended. As for me, Daniel, my thoughts were greatly alarming me, and my face grew pale, but I kept the matter to myself. Okay. So it's quite a lot in this chapter. And indeed, with these three chapters, seven through nine, I'm only scratching the surface and, and the things that I'm mentioning. So just a couple of things about the book of Daniel. And by the way, I noticed that um, I'm hoping that people got my messages. I did send two. Uh, if you know of anybody who might not know, you might want to give them a quick phone call or text them just to be on the safe side. Uh, I really don't want anyone to miss this, but and I apologize for the last minute change, uh, but it couldn't be helped. So uh, as, I, as we look at this, I want to mention a couple of things about the the kind of literature that we're that we're seeing here. This is what's known as uh, as apocalyptic, apocalyptic, and the term apocalypse is an interesting one that, regrettably, in our culture, is one that has been overused and has been misused over and over. So when you know when when in our modern culture, particularly here in America, when we hear the term apocalypse. We're so infected with the Hollywood version of the term apocalypse that we think that apocalyptic has to do with some type of end of the world type of uh, scenario and the cataclysmic catastrophic event where everything is blowing up and the world is blown to smithereens and all that. And nothing could be further from the truth. That's not at all what apocalyptic has to do with. So the term apocalypse comes from the Greek word apocalypsis, which essentially means a revelation right? Something that is revealed, something that at one point was hidden, and you perhaps even had like a veil that was preventing you from seeing it. And all of a sudden now that veil is removed so that you can see that thing clearly. So if you think, for example, of that situation in 2 Kings 6, where I believe it's 2 Kings 6, where Elisha is there with his servant, and they're surrounded by the armies of, of, uh, of Assyria, and, and then the, the servant says something to the effect of, or rather, Elisha says, because the servant is afraid, and he says something like, Yahweh opened his eyes so that he can see. And then all of a sudden, the veil is lifted, and then he can see. Or you think of, of you know, uh, the revelation that was given to John, right? We, we refer to the book of Revelation, an alternative name for the book of Revelation is what? is the apocalypse, right? The apocalypse of John, people will, will commonly say, for that reason, right? Because it is, it was a, a, a lifting of, of, of a veil, so to speak, an understanding where now he could see and now he could understand. So the term apocalypsis has to do with a revealing of something that was at one point unseen. <clears throat> and now for whatever reason, the Almighty wants it to be seen. So in the context of New Testament, and, and not just the New Testament, but the scriptures in general, because Daniel, of course, is, is in the Tanakh. It's, uh, so the term apocalypsis has to do uh, with, uh, not with some kind of cataclysmic event necessarily, but it has to do with an unveiling so that you can understand. And that's the kind of literature that we're seeing here in the book of Daniel. It's an unveiling through means of dreams and visions. Uh, this revelation that Yahweh has given to Daniel about future events. And I don't want to go too deeply into this, but when you consider, for example, the prophets, you know, prophets like Jeremiah and Isaiah and Ezekiel and, and the 12 uh, minor prophets, etc., you, you see a different flavor of, of, of prophecy than you would consider. So Daniel is considered to be prophetic in nature. Um, not so much in Jewish circles, but generally speaking to most people, uh, it's, it's, it's viewed as in that sense. But uh, it's, it's prophetic, 
well, I shouldn't say in Jewish circles, it is viewed as prophetic, but it's just, it's, it's looked at differently than Jeremiah or Isaiah or Ezekiel, partly because of the reasons that I'm mentioning. So the, the kind of prophecy that you see, for example, in a Jeremiah has to do with events that are typically immediate in nature that are just about on the verge of happening and not necessarily as far out into the future as you see being described here in the book of Daniel. So Daniel is very different, right? With, with prophets like Isaiah and Jeremiah, they, were, they had the character of what was known, uh, what's known among scholarly circles typically as covenant lawyers, right? They're covenant lawyers or they're, they're protectors and, and um, they're protectors and, and I, don't, I can't even think of another word. Uh, they're, they're conveyors of the Torah and protectors of the, of the Torah. And they let the people know, okay, these are the things that Yahweh promised as part of his covenant that were blessings if you would obey the word. And these are things that would be considered to be curses in, up to and including death and exile if you disobey. And then they would try to get the people to return, to come back, to, to repent of the direction in which they were going and to turn from that so that they could be restored to Almighty Yahweh's graces, right? With Daniel, that's not the case. Daniel's not preaching and conveying the prophecy. As a matter of fact, whereas Isaiah and Jeremiah, those messages, those prophecies are being uh, broadcast broad, very broadly to the people, right? Daniel doesn't do any of that, right? He's, he's not conveying that message necessarily to the people. He's, he's writing it down, but he's not promoting it necessarily to, to the individuals. It's going to be known to the people of Yahweh because his faithful need to know, and it's particularly for the faithful of Yahweh for which that message is being given. But it's not a message of necessarily of turning from your ways and repentance. It's a message, it's, the, it's a, the, the other end of this, which is Yahweh comforting his people and giving them encouragement and hope for the future. And the ultimate theme of the book of Daniel is what? It's, it's a theme of that no matter what the nations do, like you think of Psalm 2 and the nations raging and going about their business and acting like wild animals, like wild beasts, like you see here in the book of Daniel, the nations may be doing that. However, Yahweh ultimately is in control of all of those things. So no matter what the nations do, no matter how they rage, ultimately, Yahweh is going to vanquish the nations. He's going to va vanquish the pagans who oppress his people, his faithful ones. And he's, and he's in control and he's going to restore all things. So the book of Daniel ultimately is a book of hope. And by extension, something like the book of Revelation is also a book of hope. And I, I think I've been trying to convey to you in recent months a message that I want us to look at the scriptures differently and particularly at those prophetic books differently. I want us to be encouraged by them, and particularly as we see the kind of events that are happening around us, which is history, in effect, just repeating itself. It's like was it Mark Twain that said that that uh, that that history doesn't repeat, may not repeat itself, but it, it rhymes, right? Well, that's that's the way it is. There's nothing new under the sun. Everything that we're seeing nowadays with Afghanistan and with everything else, it's all they're all things that we can say that are just variations of the same thing that we've always seen in history. So while they're concerning, and while it's frustrating to watch and to see, and while in many cases we may have a personal vested interest because of, for example, loved ones who may be in the military or you know, people who may be out there and diplomats and other things, and just things that are happening, generally speaking, in the world around us, we certainly have a vested interest in those things and we feel pain for that. And it's just as human beings, right? We feel pain for that. Right? Not just as Americans, but just as, as human beings. We, we just hate to see it happen. And we keep all that in prayer and ask Yahweh for his mercy, for his compassion with all the people who are going through these things. And then not just in terms of the geopolitical affairs, but also the natural disasters. I mean, right now, the hurricane season and all the things that are going through, and the vi certainly the pandemic, and all the people who are dying and sick and all the things that are going on. As we see all these things happening and all this turmoil, the seas that are raging around us, it would be very easy for us to lose heart. And then when we look at something like the book of Revelation or the book of Daniel, 
in, in if you look at those if those at those books from a certain standpoint, you become even more afraid, right? Because you start looking, you start focusing on on things like tribulation and persecution and the mark of the beast and all right. And and my feeling is okay. We know that those things are going to happen, but why focus on those things? Do we think? Do we believe? Honestly, do we believe that Yahweh intended for us to specifically focus on those things? I don't believe so. I believe that in, instead they were written to let us know ahead of time that help is on the way, that he is in control. And our focus should be on fulfilling his mission in proclaiming the good news and proclaiming the gospel message to the peoples, letting them know that Yahshua is king. And that his throne is established in the heavens. And that there is a better way. And let the things continue to happen. Let the nations continue to rage and the disasters happen. All the things happen around us. But understanding, like Moses described in some places like Psalm 92, that things are going to fall around us, but Yahweh is going to shield us. And it doesn't mean that none of us are going to be affected by those things, right? Because that's naive. Some of us will be affected, and some of us will even be perhaps even martyred someday. But not, that's not our destiny. Our destiny is glory. Our destiny is to reflect the image of Almighty Yahweh throughout the earth. Our destiny is resurrection into glorified bodies that are unaffected by the things that are happening around us any longer, where no more tears and no more pain. That's our destiny. And those are the things that we're meant to focus on when we look at Daniel and Revelation. Those are the things that I want to focus on. So as we go through these things, please keep that underlying thing in mind. Another thing I want you to keep in mind with apocalyptic literature, of which Daniel and Revelation are, and also parts of Ezekiel, uh, and, and, and there are other sections of scripture as well, um, is that uh, apocalyptic, this is so, so important. Apocalyptic relies heavily on figurative language, figurative language, okay, metaphor, um, you know, comparisons, simile, etc., right? So it's important that as we look at many of the texts, both in Daniel and Revelation, things that we, like time-honored traditional viewpoints of certain of the things that are written there, we have to be willing to examine those in the context of the first century world in which they were written, in, in the case of the book of Revelation, and in the case of Daniel, you know, sixth century, uh, seventh century, sixth century, we have to be willing to understand it in the context, BCE, of course, in that context to what it meant to those individuals, and then extrapolate from that what it means to us in our present day. And I want to be very careful about how I say these things, because I don't want you to get the impression that I think that, okay, well, all those things that are described there, they're completely metaphorical, and they all happened at that time, and not, there's nothing left to be fulfilled in our time that I'm saying something like that. No, I'm not saying anything like that. As a matter of fact, I, I believe I, spoke, I mentioned this last week, but I want to say it again. I believe that prophecy resonates in different time periods in human history. But you can never divorce it from whatever that prophetic text says. You can never divorce it from the original context in which it was written. Okay, so for example, if you take the passage in, in Isaiah, uh, Isaiah 7. In the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, the son of Uzziah, king of Judah. This is during Isaiah's time. And he's under threat of nations. There are two nations in particular that he's under uh, uh, by which he's under threat. And Yahweh speaks to Isaiah, and he says in verse 10, can everyone see that? Ask a sign for yourself from Yahweh your Elohim. Make it deep as Sheol, high as heaven. And then when he... When he speaks to him a little bit further down, he says what? He says, oops, I missed it. I'm sorry. Verse 14, 
Therefore, Yahweh himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel, Elohim with us. He will eat curds and honey at the time he knows enough to refuse evil and choose good. Now stop there. So verse 14, therefore Yahweh himself will give you, Ahaz, a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel. So what do we know that prophecy to be? Is it not a, a, a prophecy of Messiah, of Yahshua? Yes, right? How do we know that? Because we're told, right? In the New Testament, we're clearly told in places like Matthew, right? So, so, so how do we do that? Because look, when you look at this, this was written to Ahaz. And if you keep reading, for before the boy will know enough to refuse evil and choose good, the land whose two kings you dread will be forsaken. Yahweh will bring on you, on your people, and on your father's house such days as has never come since the day that Ephraim separated from Judah, the king of Assyria. And then if you go a little further down in Isaiah 9, he, he tells him a little bit further, right? He says, all right, so you look verse 6, for a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty Elohim, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There'll be no end to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish and to uphold it with justice and righteousness. Clearly a messianic text, right? But that sign is given. We can even, let's not even talk about that text right now. Let's, let's talk about just that sign. So as he's describing all this, he's explaining how let's see here. I miss it here? Okay, let me see. Anyway, I don't want to waste time looking for the verse at the moment, but the bottom line is that when you continue to read here, you see that the fulfillment of, the, of that particular prophecy in, in 714 is fulfilled in as an actual sign in the time of Ahaz. So does that, in my point is this, does that invalidate the application to Yahshua the Messiah? Not at all. But yet you have scholars who will say, well, that, was, that has nothing to do with, uh, you know, they say, uh, with Jesus, because this was something that was done for Ahaz. So that was probably talking about Hezekiah or this one or that one or whatever. It's beside the point. You're missing the point. You see that over and over again with prophecy, where there is a fulfillment that meant something very specific to whom it was written. And yet there are residences that go way beyond that particular time. And you see that over and over again in the scripture. So don't ever make the mistake of thinking that, well, because this prophecy is, you know, it, it was fulfilled in this particular thing, there's nothing else that has to do with any kind of resonances into the future, because that simply isn't true. And that's a, a pattern that you see throughout the scriptures over and over again. Okay. It's not like a, it's not like a one and done type of thing necessarily. Sometimes the prophecy is fulfilled and, it, it, and it's meant to give you a foreshadow of what lies ahead. That's why when I look at something like, and I explained this last week, like fallen, fallen, Babylon the Great. Well, Babylon the Great fell at least a couple of times in history. But there is something yet in the future that's going to resonate with regard to falling Babylon, which is a greater amplification of that or an intensification, if you will. So just understand that that happens. But by the same token, on the other end of the spectrum, you can't make prophecies pretend that they didn't happen, that certain things weren't fulfilled at a particular time when they were in fact fulfilled. The reason I'm taking a lot of time to explain this is because when you look at things like Matthew 24, you have to recognize there were certain things that were written that the people of his day, Yahshua's day, would have seen happening in their day. So a lot of the things you see in Matthew 24 were fulfilled, at least partially, in their day. So all that you see in Matthew 24, you could project it into what happened when the Romans attacked in 70 common era and destroyed Jerusalem, burned down the temple, and put an end to Judah. Does that mean that that's the only fulfillment and there are no resonances into the future? No. But we have to be careful not to, to take things out of context and not to recognize those elements that have, in fact, been fulfilled. And the reason I say that is because, you know, we, we get kind of fearful sometimes and we think, well, we're waiting for this great tribulation that's going to occur. 
but that what's being described there already happened. So does it mean that we're not going to have persecution in the future? Of course not. That's why I'm saying there is resonance, but just don't don't overblow something to the point where this is we this is going to be the worst thing that ever happened on the face of you. It's happened before. And much of it will happen again, but not in the same way. So we have to be prepared, but not fearful. We have to be, we have to be aware, but to the extent possible, not anxious. Because some people are so wound up in knots because of prophecy, right? Because of the things that they've heard. And oh, this is, is you know, they, they hear this is, you know, this is like unique. It's never happened in history. It's happened repeatedly in history. And they survived. And so will we. And that's the point that I want to get across with that. Let's go back a little bit. Let's go back to Daniel. Um, and I'm going to bring up the, uh, the, the, the passage again. So I have so much to share that I don't even know where to begin. All right. So going back to, to Daniel, uh, excuse me, to Daniel 7. So you have these four beasts, right? And I wanted to show you a visual today, actually. Uh, and I, I, I literally just pulled this at random. Uh, this was something that I found literally did a little Google search. You know, I'm just going to bring that up momentarily. And you should see it in just a moment here. Okay, can everybody see that? Okay. Uh, I don't know if I can make this any larger. Let's see. Tell you what, let's do it this way. Any better? Cool. Okay, so if you look at this image here, it kind of summarizes it. And I like this, this image because it it shows the uh, it shows the the image side by side uh, with the, the chapter seven with chapter two. And I want to give credit where credit is due. That's from a place called Harvest House. Okay, uh, so they're showing this. This is what you would what you would see in Daniel seven, and then this is what you would see in Daniel two. And you remember last week I, I read Daniel two and showed you a comparison with the statue, the dream that Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar had. And by the way, I want to mention this about Daniel, which is quite interesting. Uh, the book of Daniel. I don't, I don't know if you remember, but the book of Daniel is, that I mentioned this is written in both Hebrew and Aramaic. Okay. Aramaic is a Babylonian dialect. It's, it's Semitic, but it's Babylonian in effect. So when you look at the, at the square script that we normally see in Hebrew, that's Hebrew, but it's not the ancient Hebrew. The ancient Hebrew is like more scratches and, you know, it's, it's very different. It's, you've seen probably the Paleo Hebrew. So the square script that you see is actually from out of, out of Babylon. It's, a, it's an Aramaic square script is what it is. Okay? And it's interesting because when you look at the book of Daniel, the structure of the book reflects some of what you're seeing in, in terms of their captivity. So there are 12 chapters to the book of Daniel. And when you get to around Daniel chapter 2, it starts off, chapter 1 is in Hebrew. And then chapter two begins in Hebrew. And then when you get to, to Daniel four, uh, excuse me, Daniel two, then the astrologers answered the king, may the king live forever. And they, they answered the king, but they answered the king in Aramaic. And from that point on, everything's in Aramaic, which is very similar to the Hebrew, but there are some significant differences. And then from Daniel 7, excuse me, Daniel 2, from around verse 4, through the end of Daniel 7, all of that's in Aramaic. And all of a sudden, back and when you get to Daniel 8, then it switches back to Hebrew again. And it's Hebrew from 8 to 12. And there's also what's called a chiastic uh, structure to the book of Daniel, where the term chiasm comes from the Greek letter xi, which, has, which is an, like an X, and it has to do with like a crisscrossing pattern. And usually the way that that works is that you have one thing 
and then you have its opposite towards another end, and then you have but something similar to it on the other end, and then you have another thing and similar to it, and, and there's a whole pattern there. So for example, you see Daniel chapter two, you have Nebuchadnezzar with his dream, and then you have uh, seven, which is the dream with the four beasts, which is what we see in that chart, right? So what you're seeing described then in a chiastic pattern, I don't think I have that here. Oh, okay. So it's like it, so. This is uh, by the way, a lot of the material that I that I cover in terms of background is I think I mentioned a fellow by the name of Tremper Longman. So this book is really cool. If anyone wants, it's called How to Read Daniel. Uh, so you look at, at at a dream of this is chapter two, a dream of a statue representing four kingdoms, and then you have in chapter seven a vision of beasts representing four kingdoms. So you have A, and then what's called the way you would describe it, A, and then A prime, right? And that's those are two bookends. And then you're working your way inwards. B, a court conflict, the three friends in the fiery furnace. That's Daniel 3. And then B prime is a court conflict, Daniel and the lion's den, Daniel 6. And then in between, in the middle, you have C, a court contest interpreting the book of dream, that's Daniel 4. And then C prime, a court contest interpreting the writing on the wall, Daniel 5. So this is a very definite structure that I believe is, is you know, commissioned from on high to be able to convey certain lessons to us. So the fact that Daniel 2 and Daniel 7 are chiastic representations of one another is significant and it's, it's important. There's an order that Yahweh presents there. So we're going to come back to Daniel 2 in just a little bit. Do you see Daniel 2 on screen? Okay. But let's go back to, uh, to Daniel 7. So and in fact, let me take you to the image of so that I could just kind of explain it from there. So if you're comparing Daniel 2 here and then Daniel 7 here, so you have the lion. The first one is a lion with wings, and that is representative of the Babylonian Empire, right? That's, that's equivalent to the gold statue, the, the head of the statue in Daniel 2. Then you have the bear, which is representative of the Medo-Persian Medo -Persian Empire, and that's the chest. Then in uh, the, then the leopard with the wings, that's representative of the Greek empire. And then that's representative of this bronze portion in the, um, in the, um, on the statue. And then you have the beast here, which is that, that beast that could barely even be described, right? It's even here, the representation they have here is just kind of an arbitrary thing because you don't really see a description of that beast. It's like described with iron teeth and it's just very fierce and that corresponds to those legs. And then you have the, the feet in the, in the, the statue in Jan, Daniel 2 rep, shows even more where it represents these, these feet as being a mixture of iron. So it's kind of an extension of this iron, but it's a mixture of iron and clay because they're just not mixing. And then all of a sudden in chapter two, this stone that's cut without hands comes and breaks the statue in pieces. And then in Daniel four, you see something different. And I'll go back to that in the actual text. I, want, I also want you to know, because we're going to come back to this in Daniel eight, the ram here and the he goat. And we're going to come back to Daniel 8, the ram and the hego. The ram is going to be representative of the Medo-Persian Empire. So in chapter 8, we get, we get a more detailed explanation of what happens with the bear and the leopard. The ram and then the hego represents Greece. Okay. So all of this is a description. When you look at all of them, whether it's Daniel 2, Daniel 7, Daniel 8, they're all talking about similar things. And it has to do with the nations, with the pagan nations that are in control, seemingly in control, but ultimately it's not them in control at all. Ultimately it's Yahweh in control. Let's go back to the text of Daniel 7 and notice what happens. With these beasts. So with that last beast, the leopard has uh, four wings of a bird, and the beast also had four heads, and dominion was given to it. Okay. After this, I kept looking, and this 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 four heads is for the leopard, right? 
After this, I kept looking in the night visions and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrifying. That's the one with the iron teeth and it crushes down the remainder of them. Okay. While I was contemplating the horns, behold, another horn, a little one came up among them and three of the first horns were pulled out by the roots before it. And behold, this horn possessed eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth uttering great boasts. So as I said last week, depending on the time frame of history, because history repeats itself, as I just said, some may, may view the end of this vision as being the Greece empire, and then others may view it as going further out into Rome. So, and, and it still applies, because whether you're talking about Greece, or you're talking about Rome, you, history repeats itself, okay? So we're going to see in greater detail in chapter eight, what happens with this, this little horn, okay? But what's happening is that you have this, this, this leopard that has four heads, let me find it here. And then when you go down to the explanation, the only one that you give, or, or you get a really detailed explanation about is about the, four, is the fourth piece, because that's the only one that Daniel specifically asked about. So we'll come back to that. But the, the leopard with the, the four heads, why four heads? Because, and, and notice also it has, okay, just give me a minute because I'm, I'm seeing so many things that it's, it's, it's all melding in my head and I wanna get my, my bearings about me here. So just bear, bear with me for a minute. Yeah. Okay. So the beast also had four heads and dominion was given to it. So what's happening there? So the, the, that leopard, that third empire is the Grecian empire, the Hellenistic empire, if you will. And the thing about the Hellenistic empire was that it was led initially by Alexander. Now, of course, Daniel would not have known that in his time, right? But Alexander, who was known as Alexander the Great, was a one of the most famous powerful military strategist of all time, but his life was short. And when he died, his heir was very young. So instead what they did was they divided his kingdom into uh, among his four top generals known as the, the, the Adoke, I believe. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that great, the Adoke. It's four generals of which two of them became very important. One of them was in the North, with the capital in Antioch, Syria, they were known as the Seleucids. And then the ones in the South with their capital in what became known as Alexandria in Egypt, they became known as the Ptolemies, okay? So there was a back and forth in history between the Ptolemies and the Seleucids and who's caught in the middle of all this, Judah, all right? So this power play between the Ptolemies and the Seleucids went on for quite some time until around 63 before Common Era, it actually was, was starting to come to a, to a halt because of the intervention of another major power around mid second century BCE, by, uh, of, uh, which was Rome, of course, but it didn't come to final fruition until 63 BCE when a general named Pompey finally came in and took over Judah. And then from that point on, you have a lot of the history that you see described in the New Testament with the Caesars, et cetera, okay? So that's just kind of a broad, broad stroke background. So all of these things are written in the context of these, of, these, of these kingdoms and the turmoil that's going on. So the seas that are represented in this, uh, in this, in this book are representative of not just the, of, of, of uh, the nations, but the beasts also, just the concept of the beasts is also considered to be mixed with the oceans. It's like evil, this chaos, it's this constant raging. It's like I, I showed you in Isaiah 57 uh, last, last time. Is the text back up? Is the text back up? Yes.
uh, Isaiah 57, 20 and 21. But the wicked are like the tossing sea, which cannot rest, whose waves cast up mire and mud. There is no peace, says my Elohim, for the wicked. So the seas are representative of this primordial chaos. And the indication is that the nations are always in turmoil. And then when you look at the beasts themselves, they're hybrids, right? They're, 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 uh, they're unnatural. Uh, when you think about some of the, the clean and unclean laws with regard to food, well, you know, is there a definite rationale as to why something is clean or not? There are all kinds of opinions, but one of the things you can definitely say is that things that are unclean tend to not match what they look like or what they are. So for example, you take something like a fish, a fish is in water and has fins and it has scales, which is very appropriate to the water, right? But then when you look at something like a lobster, a lobster looks like a giant bug, right? It looks like, it looks like a land animal that's in the water. That's unnatural. It's just something weird about that, right? It's just a little quick aside about that. So when, when people in, in, in that time would have heard these pronouncements by Daniel, when they would have read this, it would have been horrifying to them. And they would have understood it. They would have understood. That's one thing about apocalyptic that to us in the 21st century, we look at these things and they're kind of like strange to us. And we all this talk about beasts and, you know, and, and, uh, you know, primordial waters and all this thing, right? To us, that's all kind of strange and we have to decipher it and we have to go and look in books and try to figure it all out. To the people in the time in which it was written, it would have been very clear. They would have understood the symbols, the symbolism, just like I described about the, remember about the parties, right? The, the elephant and the donkey. We don't have to explain that to one another. We know because that this is the day in which we live. And metaphors that we know in our day that are descriptive of concepts, whether they're political, whether they're economic, whether they're social, they're, they're things that we describe them in certain ways and they had the same thing. So for example, in our day, if I said to you something like uh, the, 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 the falling of the Berlin Wall was a cataclysmic world event. Well, no, let's put it better. The, the, the falling of the Berlin Wall was a, an earth shattering event. What do you understand by that? Literally, someone put that in the chat for me. I, I really want to see what you, what you think about that. The falling of the Berlin Wall was an earth shattering event. How would you interpret that? Go ahead and put it in the chat. Anybody? <clears throat> Don't worry, I won't call you out. I'll just read it. What does that mean to you? Nobody? Yeah, the falling of the Berlin Wall, it was historical. Right? It was almost unbelievable. It was, it was a historic event. So if, if you're a scholar looking 100 years from now, and you see that the, the falling of the Berlin Wall, and you don't know our culture, right? You, you, live in, you live on Mars, right? This is from the Martian Chronicles now, right? And you're looking in, in the Martian Chronicles, and you're in your 20s studying in, you know, in, in Mars University, and you see that the Berlin Wall was an earth-shattering event. So what are you going to think? Is it, are you going to think, there was, an, there was an earthquake and the Berlin Wall fell, right? You might. Yeah, it's an event that occurred and touched the lives of the whole world. Exactly, exactly. It's, it's, it's hyperbolic, right? It was, it was so incredible that it was, it was it, 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 it's as if, as if it reverberated, the ramifications of that reverberated through the entire world. But anyone who lived at that time wouldn't have dreamed of that, right? You, you know, you, this is, you know what it is because you live in this time. None of you confused it for an earthquake, right? So when we look at things then like in the book of Isaiah that says that, the, that the, the, the moon is going to be like blood and the sun is going to be this way and the stars are going to fall from the sky, please understand that it is, it is also metaphor. But in our day, we have the tendency to interpret all those things as literal interpretations. So when we see those things, we immediately make assumptions about everything being literal and we don't understand the geopolitical nature of many of the things that are written, okay? So when they look at things like beasts and all that, that wouldn't have surprised them at all. It would have horrified them because of the hybrid and because biblically you're not supposed to mix different things, right? But, you know, that would have been the effect of it, which is the intended effect for them to have revulsion at that, because that's the idea that you want to convey. You want to convey the idea that 
these nations are wicked and that they're evil and that they're they're powers that are trying to oppress us and they're unnatural powers that are unholy, right? And you get that very vividly and very viscerally, but in no in, in no way, shape, or form would anyone have have interpreted those things as actual beasts coming up out of the sea, right? Or horns, beasts with horns, whatever. It, it, they would have understood that horns are symbolic of power and powers and kings and, and the like. So as we're reading through these things, understand that those things are in the background, okay? All right, so let's go back to, uh, to Daniel 7. And I want to go back to the, the so, so you have the nations that are, uh, so just kind of summarizing that whole portion of 7. So you have these nations that are, are going to be vanquished. And the stone in chapter 2 of Daniel comes and breaks it apart. So we'll, we'll come back to that. Let's go back to Daniel 7. And he's looking in verse 9, and he sees the throne set up. Now we, now we switch. Now we're going from this vision of beasts into a court scene. And it's a court scene in which judgment is going to be pronounced on these beasts. The Ancient of Days, that's Yahweh himself, took his seat. His vesture was like white snow and the head of his hair like pure wool. And I showed you comparisons, for example, to Revelation chapter 1. His throne was ablaze with flames, etc. There's this whole description of him and thousands attending to him. And the books were open. Then I kept looking because of the sound of the boastful words which the horn was speaking. What is that horn? Well, that horn could be Antiochus IV, who was the Greek ruler who eventually tried to vanquish Yahweh's people. But if you're thinking about it in terms of Rome, it could be one or two emperors who tried to do the same thing. So, you know, when you think about the, the, the abomination of desolation, I'm jumping a little bit ahead in chapter nine, the abomination of desolation has been interpreted in various ways. One of the ways in which it's interpreted is Antiochus IV. I showed you last week in the book of Maccabees. We didn't read it because I didn't have time to look it up. But in the book of Maccabees, it describes how Antiochus set up a, a, an image in, 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 the, uh, uh, in, the, the, in the temple, and this is what instituted that, plus his attempt to try to, sac to have people sacrifice a pig in the temple, instituted what became known as the Maccabean War, that eventually led to the independence of Judah, and to a long line of what's called the Hasmoneans, who remained in power until the Romans came in, and then things went in a different direction okay but but there have been there have been other abominations of desolation because i don't know if you're aware but in in 40 roughly 40 common era caligula and the emperor caligula of rome tried to institute a, a statue of himself in the temple thankfully he was and i hate to sound so blunt about it but thankfully he he, he that his purpose was blunted because they, his own people assassinated him right but then a few years later the romans came and did it anyway and they not only set up abominations in the temple they destroyed it which is exactly what yahshua was talking about in matthew 24 and will it happen again i believe it will because when you look at in 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 uh in first and second thessalonians paul describes this final anti-messiah type that is also going to try to set himself up as a, as, as uh, you know, as something, as Elohim, essentially. So you have this continual pattern of abominations and desolation, right? So you see that going on here in, um, so part of what I'm saying with all this is that I want you to be careful when people come up with interpretations and they say, oh, this is this. And they're dogmatic about it, right? This, this horn, this was none other than Antiochus IV. Or some other one comes and says, this horn, this was none other than Domitian of Rome. Or this was none other than... Yeah. Just tell them, relax. Because it could have been one of many interpretations, okay? Now, I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming. And he came up to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. So I described very clearly last week this concept of coming in the clouds of heaven. The coming in the clouds of heaven is a description of, of ascendancy to the throne. So when you look at this, it, we, it, it's important to understand that 
this could be something that is being metaphorically described. And I know that that if I describe that to a lot of people, it, it, it upsets the, the notion that we all have, that we've all been taught for years and years and years and perhaps generations of Yahshua returning in the clouds and that everyone's seeing him returning in the clouds with his armies behind him. But does it mean that literally? Maybe, maybe not. We have to allow for the possibility that that is a metaphorical interpretation. It doesn't take away anything from the message of Yahshua ascending to the throne. But you need to understand that that language of ascendancy to the throne is coming directly from here, directly from the book of Daniel. So what's being described here is, is not necessarily a literal thing. He's seeing a vision, right? And when Yahshua talks about it, he, Yahshua constantly is alluding to Daniel, constantly. So the language that's being used from there is being brought into this this, this conversation that he's having, for example, in places like Matthew 24. So what is it that is being described here? And the people of his day would have understood the illusions here. So this thing of the clouds of heaven, this is a description of, of a, uh, I don't like to use the term divine as a divine being, but let's say a, a heavenly being. This is not a natural thing. This is not a, this is not a, a, a human being doing this. This is someone special. And it's interesting because it's like a son of man. So son of man is the title, as I explained last week. You see it in Ezekiel frequently. And of course, you see it in the book of Daniel. It's, uh, it's, it's a term that means like mortal. So, so Ezekiel is referred to son of man, do this. Son of man, see this. In other words, like mere mortal, come here. A mortal, come here. Let me show you this. But it's more to it. It's also you, you mortal who is, who is created in my image the image bearer, right? It's as if he's saying image bearer, do this, is he's special. And, but this one is particularly special and he's given this title. And when we see that configuration, son of man, we're meant to see this messianic vision, I believe. One like us, and by the way, he's like, he's, he's human, but he's more than human, right? He is the perfect human. He did everything perfectly, but notice that he's like a son of man. So he's human, but really beyond that. He's the cloud rider. And there were many verses that I was, I, I was going through, through with you last, year, last week to explain the concept of the cloud rider. So I don't want to repeat all those, but I went extensively, if you recall, through Psalm 18 that describes Yahweh coming for, to, to, to save his people. And Psalm 18 is, one of the, is probably one of the best examples of that, if you want to go back and see that later. But there are, there are many other places where you could see that. Um, let me see if I can give you one more. Let me see if this is a good one here. Is that right? Isaiah 19.1, is that on screen? A prophecy against Egypt. See, Yahweh rides on a swift cloud and is coming to Egypt, right? So is that necessarily meant to convey an actual literal image of Yahweh riding on a swift cloud coming to Egypt? Or is, there, is that describing his, his authority over Egypt, right? Because riding on the cloud is authority. Riding on the cloud is I'm coming in my authority. No one else comes in the cloud. Who, who comes in the cloud? The cloud of, remember the pillar of, the pillar of cloud and, and the cloud, uh, the pillar of cloud and fire? What was that? that now that was literal, right? You could, you could actually see that. But is, it, is a, it, is a, it is a representative literal thing that happened in Egypt, but is it meant literally everywhere else where you see it? Not necessarily. So, What's happening in Daniel 7, and I can give you many other verses, but I, I want to move on because I have a lot to cover, is he's, he's ascending to his throne. One like a son of man was coming, and he, was, and he came up to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. So this is interesting because he's coming to the Ancient of Days, as in the second coming, right? He's coming to the Ancient of Days. So when we think of the second coming, is the coming from heaven to earth? in a literal sense, or is the coming from Yahshua to Yahweh? When we look at John 20 and Yahshua, when you think about the, the wave sheaf offering, right? 
What does Yahshua say to Miriam? Right? He says, I haven't yet ascended to my father. Right? So she, she can't touch him. Fifteen, John twenty fifteen. Thinking he was the gardener, she said, "Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him." And Yasha said to her, "Miriam." And Yasha said in verse seventeen, "Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I, asc I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my Elohim and your Elohim." So, what is that ascension? Well, it's 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 multi layered. It's presenting himself before Yahweh as the wave sheaf offering, right? But it's also presenting himself as you're seeing here in Daniel. He is presenting himself to his father to receive his kingdom, to receive his authority. He came up to the ancient of days and was presented before him because it's time to bring judgment upon the nations. It's time to end the exile. It's time to take control over the chaos of the nations and of the seas. To him was given dominion, glory, and the kingdom that all the peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which will not pass away. And his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. So the idea of the concept is that he's, he's, bringing, he's being brought in at a time when, he's, when this mouth is mouthing off, right? Let me see if I can find it here. Because when, did we, when were we introduced to this ancient of days? While I was contemplating, verse 8, while I was contemplating the horns, behold, another horn, a little one, came up among them, and three of the first horns were pulled out by the roots before it. And behold, this horn possessed eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth uttering great boasts. So while he's uttering great boasts, all of a sudden, he keeps looking, and all of a sudden, this visage of the ancient of days in his throne, then I kept looking, verse 11, because of the sound of the boastful words which the horn was speaking. He's just going off and off about how great he is. Psalm 2. This is Psalm 2, right? I kept looking until the beast was slain. And by the way, all the nations do it, but this one is particularly represented. I kept looking until the beast was slain. In other words, while he's talking, someone comes and destroys him and slays him. Who is that? It's the one who presents himself to Yahweh. It's the son of man. He's the one that's worthy, right? I kept looking until the beast was slain. We're not told by whom, but we know by whom. Because we're told in verse 13 who did it and then presents himself before Yahweh. Its body was destroyed and given to the burning fire. As for the rest of the beast, their dominion was taken away. Notice, but an extension of life was granted to them for an appointed period of time. Notice that their dominion was taken away. Their life continues. So this last kingdom, let's say it was Rome, right? You can interpret it as Greece. You can interpret it as Rome. Let's say it's Rome in this context. I prefer to look at it as Rome because when Yahshua came, he came during the Roman Empire, right? So he comes, and I, I'm also going to explain partly why I think that when I talk about Daniel 2. But he comes and life is given to the other kingdoms to continue. Media Persia can continue for a while. Greece can continue. So in other words, the nations can continue to live, but their dominion is done. So right now, all these nations are ruling, right? And everyone's going around with boastful mouths and everything else. And we all think that they're in control. They all think that they're in control. They're not. Yashra is in control right now. You think that they're all in control. Why? Because they can manipulate your life and change your economics and change your social condition. No, they don't have that ultimate control over you. Yashra has control because their dominion has already been taken away. It's not a future event. I want to be very clear about that. It's now, right now. I kept looking in the night vision. This is one of the reasons why they're still there's so much chaos. Because they, they don't know what to do. The, the, you look at the UN. The UN is one of the most ineffective organizations that have ever existed in humankind's history. They're all this, right? All talk. And they're very anti-Israel too, I might add. And you know what? There are people out there who put a lot of stock in the UN and I, you know, that's fine. We can agree to disagree. I absolutely do not have any respect for the UN because I see them as representative of all this, right? And I'm just saying that 
in terms of them being representative, but all the nations, none of them have this kind of control. None of them. None of them have dominion. Yashra has dominion. He comes and he's given, uh, to him was given, verse 14, dominion, glory, and the kingdom, that all the people's nations and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is a everlasting dominion which will not pass away, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. So, okay, so how can you say that? How can you say he's in his kingdom with all the chaos and everything because we have, because we're living right now, and this is this this has become a favorite expression of mine. We're living right now in the in the in the period between the now and the not yet. We're living in that gray area between the now and the not yet. Because the king is doing his thing, right? As we're preparing, as we are proclaiming his kingdom. And we're going to see that. I'm going to take you to Matthew in a few minutes. And he's doing his thing. And then he's going to come back in the fullness of his glory, right? And why is Yahweh doing it on this timetable? I don't have a clue. That I cannot tell you. That no one can tell you. But for whatever reason, Yahweh has allowed this time period in between to fulfill his ultimate purpose. So we're going to come back to that in a little bit. But let's go back to Daniel 2. And in actuality, let's do this because uh, I, want to, I want to make sure we get through everything today. So Daniel 8. Let's go through Daniel 8 very quickly. In the third year, we'll come back to Daniel 2. And I'm going to give you a much more... Uh, Fuller picture of that. In the third year of the reign of Belshazzar, the king of a vision appeared to me. Daniel, uh, Daniel, okay, let me try that again. I'm trying to rush. In the third year of the reign of Belshazzar, the king of vision appeared to me, Daniel, subsequent to the one which appeared to me previously. So maybe two years later, after this Daniel 7 vision, I looked in the vision, and while I was looking, I was in the citadel of Susa. This is in Persia, which is in the province of Elam. And I looked in the vision, and I myself was beside the Ulai Canal. Then I lifted my eyes and looked, and behold, a ram which had two horns was standing in front of the canal. Now the two horns were long, but one was longer than the other, with the longer one coming up last. I saw the ram budding westward, northward, and southward, and no other beast could stand before him, nor was there anyone to rescue from his power. But he did as he pleased and magnified himself. They all do. They always do, right? So that's the ram. While I was observing, behold, a male goat was coming from the west over the surface of the whole earth without touching the ground. It's interesting, without touching the ground. In other words, it was, it was like flying almost, right? It, in other words, it, it was coming from the west over the surface of the earth so quickly that it barely even touched the ground. It was, it was, it was expanding very quickly. That was Alexander. And the goat had a conspicuous horn between his eyes. He came up to the ram that had the two horns, which I had seen standing in front of the canal, and rushed at him in his mighty wrath. So what's happening? Greece is overcoming the Medes and the Persians. So the ram, two horns, or the ram, right? Media, Persia, one horn each, right? He came up to the ram, which I'd seen standing in front of the canal, and rushed at him in his mighty wrath. I saw him come beside the ram, and he was enraged at him. And he struck the ram and shattered his two horns, and the ram had no strength to withstand him. So he hurled him to the ground and trampled on him, and there was none to rescue the ram from his power. So Greece overtakes Media Persia and becomes an empire. Then the male goat magnified himself exceedingly. Like I said, they all do. But as soon as he was mighty, the large horn was broken. Who's the large horn? Alexander. Their powers, right? This is figurative language. And in its place, there came up four conspicuous horns towards the four winds of heaven. East. South, north, east, west, north, and south, right? East and west, sort of inconsequential, not completely, but sort of inconsequential in the big, to our story, right? But north and south, so when you see later, we're not going to go through that, but I think it's around chapter 11, the kings, it talks about the kings of the north and the kings of the south. These are the ones it's talking about, these two particular horns, which is the Seleucids and the Ptolemies. And that's where Judah found itself in between those two. Four horns toward the four winds of heavens. Out, out, of one, then, uh, out of one of them came forth a rather small horn, which grew exceedingly great toward the south, toward the east, and toward the beautiful land. What's the beautiful land? What's the beautiful land? Judah, right? That's Judah. It grew up to, how do I know that? Let's keep reading. It grew up to the host of heaven. What grew up? 
this small horn that came out from them and caused some of the hosts and some of the stars to fall to the earth and it trampled them down. What are those stars? See how this is all figurative language? We're not talking about actual stars falling to the earth, right? These stars, it's the same thing as you see over in Daniel 12. This is the audience to whom Daniel is writing. I wish this had autocorrect. Multitudes, this is Daniel 12, 2. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. What is that? It's resurrection, right? Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens, and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. It's the wise, it's the righteous, it's the ones that are described in Daniel 2 as the, the faithful of Yahweh the ones who are the subjects of the kingdom who to whom the kingdom is given. So back to Daniel 7. So the stars, this horn grows up to the host of heaven and cause some of the hosts and some of the stars to fall to earth and trample them down. In other words, he rages a persecution against the righteous ones. It even magnified itself to be equal with the commander of the host. And they removed the regular sacrifice from him and the place of his sanctuary was thrown down. What's that? That's abomination, desolation. That's corruption of the temple etc and on account of transgression the host will be given over to the to the horn along with the regular sacrifice and it will fling truth to the ground and perform its will and prosper then i heard a holy one so this is a a, a a persecution against the righteous then i heard a holy one speaking and another holy one said to that particular one who was speaking how long will the vision about the regular sacrifice apply while the transgression causes horror, so as to allow both the holy place and the host to be trampled. He said to me, for 2,300 evenings and mornings, then the holy place will be properly restored. Okay, we're not going to get into the 2,300 evenings and all that because, you know, everybody wants to pinpoint those things to, to the letter and try to find something. And, you, and you, you ask 10 people what the interpretation of that is, and you'll get 12 different answers. It's worse than economists. Okay, so we're not going to do that. When I, Daniel, just know that there's a time that Yahweh has designated where he's going to refocus on the wrong thing sometimes, right? So know that, that this thing is going to be brought down. When I, Daniel, had seen the vision, I sought to understand it. And behold, standing before me was the one who looked like a man. And I heard, and this is now an angel, and I heard the voice of a man between the banks of Ulai, and he called out and said, Gabriel, give this man an understanding of the vision. Gabriel, Gabriel, it means... Something like, uh, like the word Gabor means like a strong man, almost like a, like a warrior, right? Uh, Gabor, uh, strong one of Elohim, or Elohim is strong. That's what it means. Gabriel is, is frequently pictured as sort of the spokesman of Almighty Yahweh, right? So if you think about the press secretary of the, of the president, this is Gabriel. He's kind of like a press secretary. So he came near to me where I was standing. And when he came, I was frightened and fell on my face. But he said to me, son of man, understand that the vision. And it's interesting that he identifies Daniel, son of man, right? But that's not the same son of man. It's, it's the term, but it's not, it's son of man, like with a little less, right? But it's really the big, the, the main one is the one that you saw before the ancient of days. Understand that the vision pertains to the time of the end. It's not clear whether that means the time of the end of this particular persecution or the time of the final end, right? We're not really clear on that. Now, while he was taking, talking with me, and by the way, we need to learn to be content with answers like that. We don't, like, we don't know what that exactly that means at the time of the end. Just like, did it disturb you that I said, well, we're not going to look into the 2300 evenings and mornings, right? In fact, I would dare think that some of you, if I asked you, you would have hoped that me going into these chapters that I was going to give you all the explanation of the 2300 evenings and the 70 times seven and all that stuff. Right. And I'll give you a general sense of what I think, but I'm not going to go into deep understand uh, deep interpretations of that because they're going to be just interpretations. And I guarantee you that you're going to see six other ones that are going to be different in nature. Right. So we have to become content to speak strongly where Yahweh speaks strongly and to let 
alone. What Yahweh has left deliberately ambiguous. And I believe that Yahweh has given us exactly that. He's made the language deliberately ambiguous. And that's part of what I want to teach you with looking into things like this. That we need to get away from the tendency of, well, we have to identify exactly where this thing is. Because you know what? Let me put it very bluntly. Of such things, cults are born. Because then you have the brain trusts who begin these cults who say, it's like the people who want to know the day or the hour when Yahshua comes. I mean, is it a pattern that Yahweh throughout scripture doesn't tell you exactly when something's going to occur? He gives you a sense, right? He tells Abraham, your, your, cho- you know, your children, your descendants are going to be 400 some odd years in Egypt. But he doesn't tell them exactly when. It's kind of around the general ballpark. And then he tells, you know, he tells Yahshua that no one knows the day or the hour when he's going to turn, not even the son himself. So why do we think that we're entitled to know the exact day and the exact hour? That does Yahweh want us to fortune tell? So we have to be careful. We have to be reading. Yahshua told us, to, he didn't say study the charts and get the dates right. Use the abacus and have everything exactly right. He said what? He said to read the signs of the times and learn to look at the fig tree. And when you see the fig tree falling and this and that, then you know that the end is near, right? Look at this thing. When you see this, the abomination of desolation being set up in the thing, then flee and right? So take clues from that, that Yahweh is not his intent for us to have every last thing nailed down perfectly. And the people who want to do that, you want to be very leery of, okay? I am not going to do that. I will give you a general sense, but I'm not going to do that because I don't believe that we're sanctioned to do that. Let me tell you, go a step further. I think that one of the best examples, the longer I live, the longer I, 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 I start to believe certain, certain things to a greater degree. I've, I've long thought that there is a deliberate reason why Yahweh has allowed us to have a bit of ambiguity with regard to the precise nature of the holy days and the calendar. How long have we, together with other groups who look at the calendar, how, for how long have we struggled with, is it this exact day? Is it that exact day? Is it, right? is it the first day? Is it the second day? That's not going to end until Yahshua returns. Is it because Yahweh wants us to be in confusion? I don't believe that at all, because Yahweh is not an Elohim of confusion. But here's the thing. If Yahweh would precisely say, this is exactly right, December 25th every year, right? If, if that happened, you know what people would do? They would become complacent. They would stop. They would wait till the last minute and say, we're going to live it up. And we're going to see that in Matthew for, in a minute. They would live it up, do their thing, and then at the last minute, try to squeeze in their righteousness in the last minute there. Okay, and that's only one ramification of that. So I I think that there's value in ambiguity. I'm not comfortable with ambiguity either. I'd like to be able to tell you, well, these 300 evenings, if you do this exactly from this state, it's going to bring you exactly to this place here. I don't believe Yahweh wants us to do that. I believe he wants us to be eh, in the vicinity, but that he doesn't want us necessarily to try to pinpoint a specific day, time, or hour. And I believe that that's consistent with all the situations you have where you have prophetic leanings in the scriptures. Okay, so he he goes to Gabriel. Gabriel says, give this man an understanding of the vision. So he came near to me where I was standing. And when he came, I was frightened and fell on my face. But he said to me, son of man, understand, <clears throat> understand that the vision pertains to the time of the end. Now, while he was talking with me, I sank into a deep sleep with my face to the ground. But he touched me and made me stand upright. He said, Behold, I'm going to let you know what will occur at the final period of the indignation, for it pertains to the appointed time of the end. And notice, even when they're given interpretations, he's not giving you an exact thing, right? It pertains to the time of the end. Why wouldn't the angel just say, Daniel, in the year, blah, 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 right? There's going to come a ruler. And in the year, you know, when the iron, when the kingdom with iron teeth comes into power, count three years from after when he first comes into power. And that's the year that it's going to happen. Why not do that? He doesn't. He just says it pertains to the appointed time of the end. The ram which you saw with the two horns represents the kings of Media and Persia. The shaggy goat represents the kingdom of Greece. And the large horn that is between his eyes is the first king, Alexander. The broken horn and the four horns that arose in its place represent four kingdoms which will arise from his nation, although not with his power. And that's true. None of those four kings ever even came close to the kind of power and, and, and prestige that Alexander had. And, and the two main ones, the Seleucids and the Ptolemies, they, were, they went back and forth. And sometimes Judah fell under the influence of one, 
and sometimes they fell under the influence of the other until the Romans finally came in and said, both of you step aside, and then now we're in. In the latter period of their rule, when the transgressors have run their course, is a good way to put it, a king will arise, insolent and skilled in entry. His power will be mighty, but not by his own power. And this is now th that horn, right? That really, that persecuting one. And he will destroy to an extraordinary degree and prosper and perform his will. He will destroy mighty men and the holy people. And through his shrewdness, he will cause deceit to succeed by his influence, and he will magnify himself in his heart. And he will destroy many while they are at ease. He will even oppose the prince of princes, but he will be broken without human agency. The vision of the evenings and mornings, which has been told is true, but keep the vision secret, for it pertains to many days in the future. Again, broad, vague, it pertains to many days in the future. And look, we're not the only ones in our day that are getting exhausted hearing this stuff, right? Then I, Daniel, was exhausted and sick for days. He didn't even understand it all. Then I got up again and carried on the king's business, but I was astounded at the vision and there was none to explain it. Note that, right? Note that. Not even Daniel fully understood this. So don't feel badly if we leave this with a little bit of, hmm, it's a little bit vague, it's a little bit ambiguous. Yeah, it's meant to be a little bit ambiguous. But generally speaking, we know that Alexander came into power and when he died, his thing came into four different, you know, four different powers. And one of those powers eventually from the Seleucids tried to put the, the, the squeeze on Judah and they were, and, and, and he was opposed and eventually he was taken down. And that's all that we need to know. And that's enough because that helps us to understand the general sense of what's going on here. Now, before I go into Daniel 9, and I only have a few minutes for Daniel 9, I want to go back to Daniel 2 because I think that it's important to review that. So I'm not going to read through the whole chapter, but Daniel 2 is the vision of the, of the statue, the, the dream that Nebuchadnezzar has with the statue with the different pieces. And then I want to focus towards the end when the stone comes in. I, I spoke a little bit about this last week. So he says, verse 31, you, O king, were looking and behold, there was a single great statue. That statue, which was large and of extraordinary splendor, was standing in front of you. And its appearance was awesome. The head of that statue was made of fine gold. Its breast and its arms of silver. Its belly and its thighs of bronze. Its legs of iron. Its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. You continued looking until the stone was cut out without hands. And it struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and crushed them. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed all at the same time and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away so that not a trace of them was found. But the stone that struck the statue became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Remember, it started out as a stone, it's large, enough to break the statue, but it didn't become a great mountain, mountain except over time. It fills the whole earth. So I was saying at the end of the discussion last week, that the stone, which is clearly representative of Yahshua, is the inaugurated kingdom that vanquishes the enemy and then begins to spread throughout the entire earth. It begins to fill the entire earth. And that's precisely what's been happening with Yahshua and his word through the gospel message over the course of history over the last 2,000 years, 2,000 plus years. We're spreading the message, right? So when you look at, when you look at um, someone like, somewhere like Matthew, 24. Let me see if I get the verse right here. So Matthew 24, 14, he says, and this gospel of the kingdom, Yahshua was saying to his disciples, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. Do you think that's a future event that's happening? What do you think has been happening for the last 2000 years? That's not future. That's been happening. That continues to happen to this day over 2,000 years later. When did that start? It started with the apostles. It started with the early disciples. It started with Paul, who began to literally go through the entire earth in, the, in an age where there were no airplanes or trains or anything of that nature. He began to preach in all the known world, and that work continues through all his people. Now, has the message been corrupted along the way in a number of different ways? Yes, of course. And those are discussions for another day. But there has always been a witness of the gospel throughout the earth. And that's going to be continued to preach as a testimony to all the nations. And by the way, as a testimony, it doesn't say that everyone's going to believe. Has everyone believed? Of course not. Does it say that everyone must believe? No. 
It says that it has to be preached in the whole world as a testimony, as a witness, and then the end will come. So a testimony is this is what this is the king, and this is what he stands for, and this is what he's going to do when he establishes his kingdom fully, right? That has that testimony has been proclaimed for over 2,000 years. I'm going to come back to Matthew 24. Let's go back to Daniel 2. So that, that, that stone has been growing into a mountain, filling the whole earth for over 2,000 years. Daniel 2.36, this was a dream, and we'll tell the interpretation. Okay, then he goes and he describes all the nations, right? And then down verse 44, in the days of those kings, the Elohim of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed, and that kingdom will not be left for another people. Because it's for his people. It will crush and put an end to all those kingdoms, but it will itself endure forever. Remember, what did Daniel 7 say about the Son of Man that goes before the Ancient of Days? It said that he's given all dominion, and the dominion is taken away from all the other nations. It crushes and puts an end to all these kingdoms, but it will itself endure forever. So always remember that parallel between 2 and 7. And as much as you saw that a stone was cut out of the mountain without hands and that it crushed the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great Elohim has made known to the king what will take place in the future. So the dream is true and its interpretation is trustworthy. And I made a point to saying last week that the stone, if you look in the bottom left there, the stone is the Eden, the Eden, right? And if you break that word into two, it's, it's Ayin Beit, which is Av, father, and it's Beit, Nun, which is Ben, which is son. It's the father and the son. It's the combined father and son team. Now, you say, well, that's just an interpretation, very cute, but yeah. Yeah, I don't think that's coincidental, right? I want to show you something else. Let's go over to Matthew 21. So from around Matthew 21, leading to Matthew 24, it's a description. Yahshua is building and building, talking about future events, what we would call eschatology. By the way, the, es, the word, es, I told you what apocalypsis means. The word eschatology, it comes from two words. It comes from the word eschat, uh, eschatos, which means, and I want to make sure I got that word right. So forgive me. I'm, I'm very particular that way. So um, eschatology, a good definition is the part of they say theology, let's say the part of doctrine or teaching concerning with death, judgment, and the final destiny. Okay, I don't like I don't like that definition actually. Uh, it's 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 the it's the 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 study of the last things or the end times, right? The word eschatos means last, and logi is like anything, geology, right? Philology. It's the study of. So the study of the last, the study of last things or end times, if you will. Okay, um, let me go back to the text. So let's transition over to uh, Matthew 24, excuse me, uh, Matthew 21. And we'll go down to verse, uh, let me see. Maybe verse 20, 30, 33, uh, 21, 33. So this is what's commonly known as the parable of the tenants, T-E-N-A-N-T-S, the parable of the tenants. Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard and put a wall around it and dug a wine press in it and built a tower and rented it out to vine growers and went on a journey. When the harvest time approached, he sent his slaves to the vine growers to receive his produce. The vine growers took his slaves and beat one and killed another and stoned a third. You already see where this is going? Again, he sent another group of slaves larger than the first and they did the same thing to them. But afterward, he sent his son to them saying, they will respect my son. But when the vine growers saw the son, they said among themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and seize his inheritance. They took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those vine growers? 
They said to him, he will bring those wretches to a wretched end and will rent out the vineyard to other vine growers who will pay him the proceeds at the proper seasons. So let me give you a quick interpretation of this, right? So when you look at this here, what's happening is that who is the one who, who's the landowner? Well, clearly that's Yahweh, right? He plants the vineyard and he puts the wall around it. He digs a wine press in it. In other words, he does everything to nurture it, to take care of it. To build, he built a tower to protect it, everything to protect it. He rents it out to vine growers. Who are vine growers? Vine growers are the religious officials who are supposed to be taking care of his people and of his creation. And then he goes, he, he goes on a journey. When the harvest time approached, he sent his slaves to the vine growers to receive his, pro, his produce. Who are the slaves? Well, what is a slave? A slave is a doulos, right? A slave is a, down the bottom left. When Paul introduced himself, he said what? I'm a doulos. I'm a slave. It uses the same exact word. I'm a bond servant. This is the equivalent of an Obadiah. The word Obed, Obadiah means servant of Yahweh. Obed, Yah. Obed is servant. Obed. Right? So it's an Obed. It's a slave. He sends his slaves to the vine growers. Who are these? These are the prophets of old to receive the produce. What did they do? The vine growers. They took his slaves and beat one. They killed another. They stoned the third. This is the persecution that, they, that arose against the prophets and any of the men who tried to bring the truth out. Again, he sent another group of slaves larger than the first. He kept sending them, right? This is what Yahshua says. Remember at one point he cries out, Jerusalem, I sent, right? I, I long to take you in my arms like a, like, a, like, a, like a mother hen, right? But you wouldn't have me. Instead, they, they killed everyone that he sent to him. Again, he sent another group of slaves larger than the first and they did the same thing to him. But afterward, so after all the prophets, the son himself finally comes saying they will respect my son. And of course they didn't. When the vine girls saw the son, they said among themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and seize his inheritance. It's, this, is shades of, this is shades of Psalm 2, right? All these things come and interplay together. Why do the nations conspire and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against Yahweh and his anointed, right? Who is his son? Against the vine, against the the landowner, the tenant, excuse me, the landowner and his and 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 his son, who we sent, saying, "Let us burst their bonds asunder and cast their cords from us." This is the heir. Let's cast him aside. Let's kill him so he can't take his throne. He who sits in the heavens laughs. Yahweh has them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, "I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill." I will tell of the decree of Yahweh. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will make nations your, your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. What is that? That's Daniel 7. That's Daniel 2. You will break them with a rod of iron, dominion given to him. You will break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Go back to Matthew 21. They took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do, right? So he, then he goes on and he continues. Yahshua said to them, did you never read in the scriptures, the stone which the builders rejected, this became the chief cornerstone. This came about from Yahweh and it is marvelous in our eyes. Where's that? That's Psalm 118. <clears throat> what is this thing about a cornerstone? Well, the cornerstone is necessary to keep the building you know, in, 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 in place in terms, of the, um, in terms of keeping it orderly and keeping it you know, from being, uh, you know, lopsided or whatever but they found no place for the cornerstone they rejected the stone they rejected the sun so but but yahweh was not having any of it that stone was going to be in that building no matter what they tried no matter what they did if it was not up to them it's up to yahweh so he puts them in the corner he puts them in the upper corner he fits him he finds a place for him so the stone begins rejected and it winds up in a prominent place in a corner as the cornerstone where everybody can see it and recognize its value and its importance. It didn't matter what they said. Therefore, I say to you, the kingdom of Yahweh will be taken away from you and given to a people producing the fruit of it. And he who falls on this stone, this cornerstone, will be broken to pieces. But on whomever it falls, it, would scatter, it will scatter him like dust. What is that? That's Daniel 2. That's the stone. That's the bend, right? It, it, it's a play on words, right? They will respect my son. He sent his son to them, his Ben to them, saying they will respect my son. But they rejected him and, and they killed him. And they thought that it was over, but he was going to glorify his son. Psalm 2, Daniel 2, the stone which the builders rejected, 
The word in Greek is, 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 is uh, lithos, but the word in like lithographic, lithos, but the word in Hebrew would be equivalent to, well, what is it, right? When you go out to, let's, let's, let's see it. I mean, it, there's so much in here. Look at this, Psalm 18. All the nations surrounded me, but in the name of Yahweh, I cut them down. They surrounded me on every side, but in the name of Yahweh, I cut them down. They swarmed around me like bees, but they were consumed as quickly as burning thorns. In the name of Yahweh, I will cut them down. You see that? Yahweh is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. There's just so much to cover that I can never get through it in, in, in five studies, right? It's just Yahweh is chasing me severely, but he has not given me over to death. Open me for me the gates of the righteous. I will enter and give thanks to Yahweh. Loaded, loaded with messianic pronouncements. I will give you thanks for you answered me. You have become my salvation. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Yahweh has done this and it is marvelous in our eyes. What is the stone? Look at the bottom left here. It's the Evan, right? Daniel 2. And what happens? The one who goes against that stone is crushed, Yahshua says, right? He says, he who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, but on whomever it falls, it will scatter him like dust, like the chaff described in Daniel 2. This is language directly from Daniel 2, imagery directly from chapter 2, and there's more, much, much more, okay? So, you know, it's, it's, it's important to keep all these things in mind. Let me run very quickly very quickly through Daniel 9 and, and, and Matthew 24. In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of Median descent, who was made king, so this is during the, the Persian Empire, who was made king over the kingdom of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, observed in the books the number of the years which was revealed as the word of Yahweh to Jeremiah the prophet for the completion of the desolations of Jerusalem, namely 70 years. So I gave my attention to Yahweh. So he's reading, and this is one of the rare instances where one prophet actually refers to another prophet that he's reading. In this case, he's reading what we would know today as Jeremiah 25, where Jeremiah talks about the exile, and he says that it's going to be 70 years that they're going to be in captivity. So he's reading this. And so I gave my attention to Yahweh Elohim to seek him by prayer and supplications with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes, because that's the kind of man Daniel was. He wants to supplicate, kind of like you see Ezra and Nehemiah doing in their day as well. I prayed to Yahweh my Elohim and confessed and said, Alas, O Yahweh, the great and awesome Elohim, who keeps his covenant and loving kindness for those who love him and keep his commandments, who have sinned, committed iniquity, acted wickedly and rebelled, even turning aside from your commandments and ordinances. Moreover, we have not listened to your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings, our princes, our fathers and all the people of the land. So this is a prayer of contrition. Righteousness belongs to you, O Yahweh, but to us open shame as it is this day. To the men of Judah, the inhabitants of Jerusalem and all Jerusalem, those who are nearby and those who are far away in all the countries to which you have driven them because of their unfaithful deeds, which they have committed against you. Open shame belongs to us, O Yahweh, to our kings, our princes and our fathers, because we have sinned against you. So this is all the condition of exile sin and degradation, right? To Yahweh our Elohim belong compassion and forgiveness, for we have rebelled against him. Nor have we obeyed the voice of Yahweh our Elohim to walk in his teachings, which he set before us through his servants, the prophets. Indeed, all Israel has transgressed your law and turned aside, not obeying your voice. So the curse has been poured out on us, along with the oath which is written in the law of Moses, the servant of Elohim, for we have sinned against him. And what is the curse ultimately led to? Exile, right? Thus he has confirmed his words which he had spoken against us and against our rulers who ruled us to bring on us great calamity. For under the whole heaven there has not been done anything like what was done to Jerusalem. As it is written in the law of Moses, all this calamity has come on us, yet we have not sought the favor of Yahweh our Elohim by turning from our iniquity and giving attention to your truth. Therefore Yahweh has kept the calamity in store and brought it on us. For Yahweh our Elohim is righteous with respect to all his deeds which he has done, but we have not obeyed his voice. In other words, he has kept faithfulness to the covenant, but we have not. And now, O Yahweh our Elohim, who have brought your people out of the land of Egypt with the mighty hand, don't be, let that be lost. Because you have brought your land out of, you have brought your people out of the land of Egypt, and the implication is that we have been exiled in a spiritual Egypt, and we are going to be delivered from Egypt again, and have made a name for yourself as it is this day. We have sinned; we have been wicked. 
O Yahweh, in accordance with all your righteous acts, let now your anger and your wrath turn away from your city, Jerusalem, your holy mountain. For because of our sins and the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and your people have become a reproach to all those around us. So now, our Elohim, listen to the prayer of your servant and to his supplications. And for your sake, O Yahweh, let your face shine on your desolate sanctuary. O my Elohim, incline your ear and hear, open your eyes and see our desolations and the city which is called by your name. For we are not presenting our supplications before you on account of any merits of our own, but on account of your great compassion. O Yahweh, hear. O Yahweh, forgive. O Yahweh, listen and take action. For your own, notice that. O Yahweh, listen and take action. In other words, Take matters into your own hands. And that's exactly what Yahweh does by sending his son, who is Yahweh returning to Zion, to do exactly what Daniel has asked him to do. Yahweh returning to Zion. He rides in on a donkey as the king coming in, as Allah Zechariah. Yahweh himself, the book of Isaiah talks about him, that Yahweh rolls up his sleeves. What does that mean? He, he, it doesn't say he rolls up his sleeves. It says he bears his arm, right? So if you go over to, and I'm rushing a bit because I got to be done in like the next five minutes here. I'm so sorry, but we have a thing that we have to take care of here. Um, what is this? Um, Isaiah. Uh, Isaiah 52, excuse me. Which is the message of, um, of the, uh, the gospel. How beautiful upon the mountains, Isaiah 52, 7. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of the messenger who announces peace, who brings good news, who announces salvation, who says to Zion, your Elohim reigns. Listen. Your sentinels lift up their voices. Together they sing for joy. For in plain sight, they see the return of Yahweh to Zion. That's Yahshua returning to Zion. Break forth together into singing, you ruins of Jerusalem. For Yahweh has comforted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. In other words, he's done what Daniel asked him to do. Yahweh has bared his holy arm before the eyes of all the nations. And all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our Elohim. Yahweh has bared his holy arm. What does that mean? It means he rolled up his sleeves. It means no one else was doing what they had to do, and the ones that he tried to send, they killed. So instead, he 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 he, un he rolled up his sleeves and said, "I'm going to take the action myself." And he does it before all the nations and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our Elohim. So going back to Daniel nine, verse twenty. Now, while I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before Yahweh my Elohim and behalf of the holy mountain of my Elohim, while I was still speaking in prayer, then the man Gabriel, whom I had seen the vision previously, came to me in my extreme weariness about the time of the evening offering. He gave me instruction and talked with me and said, O Daniel, I have now come forth to give you insight with understanding. At the beginning of your supplications, the command was issued, and I have come to tell you, for you are highly esteemed. So give heed to the message and gain understanding of the vision. And then he gives them the vision that's very famous, right? 70 weeks have been decreed for your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, to make atonement for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. So you are to know and discern that from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, and actually... This translation is, is, is a bit skewed because it says the anointed prince, right? There will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. It will be built again with plaza and moat, even in times of distress. Then after the 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off. The anointed one will be cut off and have nothing. And the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. And its end will come with a flood. Even to the end, there will be war. Desolations are determined. And he will make a firm covenant with the many for one week. But in the middle of the week, he will put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering. And on the wing of abominations will come one who makes desolate, even until a complete destruction, one that is decreed, is poured out on the one who makes desolate. Okay. 
too much to unpack here, and I'm not going to do you a disservice by trying to cram it all in. So we will continue one more week. Next week, y'all are willing, we'll start right here at Daniel 9.24. Um, and I want to I want to cover Daniel 9.24, and I want to cover also material in Matthew 24 as well, and kind of correspond these and, and wrap everything up with a with a nice bow for the time being. Okay. So let's, uh, let's stop here. But but before we do, let me just kind of give you a sense of what's happening here. So again, we're not going to go through all kinds of calculations, although it's kind of interesting that one of the main calculations, if you're, if you're thinking about these 62 weeks, the, the, the angels told Gabriel, uh, Gabriel told Daniel, it's not going to be 70 weeks, right? Because the, Jeremiah says 70 weeks, but it's not time yet. So it's going to be 70 times seven weeks. It's going to be a multiple of 70. So in effect, it's 490 years. Now, is that meant to be taken literally? Maybe, maybe not, right? Again, it's ballpark. It's ballpark. So he says to Daniel, good news, the, the exile is going to come to an end, but not just yet. In other words, their sin has been so great that 70 years it, it, it's not enough. It's 70 weeks, and most scholars are agreed that this term 70 weeks is referring to 70 years. So it's 70 times seven, 70 times seven years. 70, so it's 490 years. 70 weeks have been decreed, but it breaks it up into a 62-week period and then into one more seven-week period. Excuse me, 62-week period and, and, uh, and uh, uh, it's, it's seven weeks. And, okay, verse, uh, verse 25 uh, the second part, there'll be seven weeks and 62 weeks, in other words, 69 weeks, and then there's one more week that's unaccounted for. So the time period that's described here begins with the time when there's a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. And here's where it starts getting tricky, right? Because what, what exactly is the date that you start counting if you're going to try to come up with a specific date? And people are sort of all over the place. But if you're looking by the strict word here, then you have to consider when the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, not to rebuild the temple, but to rebuild the walls of the city, which would have, would have been, as we read recently, in Nehemiah. And that would have occurred in the time of, of, of Artaxerxes, which would have been the year, and scholars using Herodotus, which is an ancient hist uh, historian, they know that it was around 445 BCE when Artaxerxes issued that decree so that Nehemiah and, and, and Judah could rebuild the walls. So if you did a quick calculation of 69 weeks, 69 years turns out to be about 483 years. So if you did a calculation, remember the way we consider time, it's BCE, it's like a countdown. So it's going, the numbers are going down and then all of a sudden we go into common era or AD, right? And that is starting to count up again. So if you did that calculation, you'd come up to roughly around 38, AD, about 38 BC, uh, excuse me, uh, 38 uh, CE, right? And then some people do a, a slightly different calculation where they come up to around 32 CE. So that's what I don't like to get into calculations because it starts getting, you know, well, who, who do you believe? Who has the exact precise way to do it? And you, there's no way you can determine that. So people will do it in a way that's most convenient to them that tries to promote their thing, right? But, if you, but even if you look at a thing like coming up to 38 in the vicinity, well, you consider that historically, Yahshua the Messiah would have had a three and a half year ministry, and most scholars believe that he would have been around 33 and a half years old when he died. So if we're looking at the time, we're talking about 33 and a half, 34 common era when he would have been crucified. So if you're looking at 32, 38, you're talking about the vicinity, right? So rather interesting. But again, I'm not hanging myself on, on those particular dates. But any way that you look at this, it's not over. Right? 70 weeks having decreed for your people and your holy city, things have to be done to finish transgression, to make an end to sin, to make atonement for iniquity. So there are a bunch of things that deal with sin that still have to be dealt with. In other words, there's still conditions of the exile that are being dealt with, but then to bring in everlasting righteousness, seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place, those are things having to do with righteousness, future. Come. What happened here? Covenant, okay? So I don't know if everyone can still see me or not. Okay, so, so, you know, so you have conditions of exile that are still in process for various reasons. And then you have the period of time when this anointed one comes in 
And, you know, there's some scholars that say, is that Messiah? This is like I said, a skewed translation. Is that actually speaking about Yahshua? I believe it is. There are some scholars that will say, well, it's not necessarily pointing to him. I don't think it makes sense other than looking at that as the Messiah, because it fits perfectly. But then it talks about this last ruler, right? It says, it says that after 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing. And the people, the prince who is to come, will destroy the city and the sanctuary. And then there are other things that are happening there with stopping sacrifice and grain offering, you know, the abomination of desolation that's brought in, etc. So what's happening there? Well, we'll talk about that a little bit more next time. Okay, Yahweh willing, we'll, we'll do that next week. And I'll focus, like I said, just on Daniel 9 and, uh, and, and Matthew 24 and, and peripheral scriptures there. But I want to go more through Daniel 2, Daniel 7, uh, and 8, because I think that all of that is important to understand all of this that we're talking about in, in Daniel 9 as precursor. Because the bottom line is that Yahshua the Messiah is his kingdom has been inaugurated. And therefore, they're still in, we're still in the midst of, even in our day, in the midst of fulfilling um, this gospel message, what you see in, in, in Matthew 24, 14, so that this witness can be given throughout the whole earth. And when you look at the things that happen, and I'll give you a little precursor, uh, a little preview for next week. When you're looking at the things that happen in Yahshua's time, and shortly after his death, within, within 40 years of his death in 70 common era with the Romans, when you think about him talking about birth pangs, right? The, the, the convulsions are worst when the birth pangs take place. So when was the birth of, in, in effect of the kingdom? It would have taken place in that time not in our present day. So are we talking about these birth pangs that we refer to? Are we talking about future? Are we talking about something that's already occurred and that we're still feeling the effects of it to this day? I believe it's the latter, okay? But we'll talk a little bit more about that next week when we have time. Uh, because of what we read in Daniel 7, can we conclude then that Rome is the fourth kingdom that was given power, but not of its own, and is still reigning up to today? Okay, so I wouldn't go so far as to say that they're still reigning up to today, but I think that in their day, Rome was the fourth kingdom that was given power. But there is a, it, it, my current understanding is that those, the, the feet of that statue is a mixture, an intermingling of the iron and clay. In other words, there, there's, there's Rome-like elements in that final kingdom, but there's also clay mixed in, which makes it, a very strange combination where there's no stability in that final kingdom. I believe that that's yet to come. I believe that that's going to institute event that's going to eventually culminate in what we know from the scriptures, anti Messiah, who's going to be a final anti Antiochus the fourth type, a final horn type. So when I talk about prophecy resonating into the future, even after having been fulfilled to a certain degree. That's one of the resonances that I think is we're meant to see in history so that we can better assess what's going to happen in the present day. So I don't know if, if that, it, it, we may see, we, we may already have the beginnings of that in his, going on already, but there's no way to fully know that. So let's address that a little bit more next week so, uh, so that we can, you know, so we don't have to rush it, okay? Also next week, I will speak with you about the Feast of Trumpets because it's just around the corner and I want to have a better sense of how we're going to be looking for that because it could be one day, it could be the next day. And I want to make sure that we're all on the same page with regard to that. So Yahweh willing next week, we'll touch on uh, Daniel 9, Matthew 24, and we'll also talk about the Feast of Trumpets. Okay. All right, everyone. Thank you so much. I'm sorry. I don't have time for questions today. Uh, I have to run, but uh, I appreciate your, uh, your, your being here. So I'll just uh, bow for a quick prayer. Almighty Yahweh, we thank you. For